All right, if you would please take your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 15. And as you do so, if you want to keep a finger there, and turn also to Genesis chapter 3. So we're going to be looking at both of those. We'll actually start in Genesis 3, but then quickly going back to Mark 15, looking at both of those things. And, and I do hope that you're having a, a happy Mother's Day today and, and enjoying this day with getting together probably with friends and family and, and celebrating that. And, you know, the older you get when you, you have those kinds of, of, of time, you know, kids, that they start sharing stories of mom and dad and, you know, the, the family stories that everybody considers as precious. And usually one of the things that will come up at some point is that the kids will very lovingly and yet probably mockingly talk about the fact like mom could never get the right name when she went, you know, she has to start rolling through the list of kids and then, and then you know, you, you hit the right name and then you, you go past it, you, you go, and you have to roll through again to get to it again. And you know, that, the kids start laughing at that and just like, oh, it's ridiculous. How could you not get the right name? You, you messed that up so bad. And uh, don't feel bad. Because there's a study, actually, that was done out of Duke University just a, a couple of years ago that concluded that you shouldn't get upset about that because, one, you're going to do it, too, so there's that. But there's also this idea that, that what parents, what, why that happens is because there's a, a mental basket, a, a mental location, so to speak, of which all the names of your loved ones are all in that basket, and they just kind of simply reach in there quickly and grab the wrong name. But there's a reason why they go through, like, the siblings, your siblings, and not necessarily the coworkers or the people down the street or the neighbors or something. There's, because there is this basket of loved ones, and you're in a good container, so to speak. They just reach the wrong one. And you actually might find yourself doing it in other scenarios, too. It might, it's not necessarily just family. Like you might have a basket of coworkers, and so you probably aren't calling your coworkers by your kids' names, but you might be using different coworkers' names to refer to various ones at times too. And like it's just because it's in that mental basket that's in your head that that's that's going there, and so it's a good thing because you're in the loved ones' basket, and that's where you want to be. And uh, it's probably also why the you know if you've come across in a situation where you find somebody that you know in a certain context, and you see them in a store or they're dressed differently, and you look, and you almost can be like. You, know, you see them, like, well, hey, and you just go about your business, and they're just like, wait a minute, I know you, but, but not here. Like, we're in the wrong context. It doesn't quite fit. It's almost a case of mistaken identity, so to speak, because the wrong basket, we're searching through the wrong basket, so it takes us a minute to figure that out. We realize, though, that there are also some baskets in only which one name can fit. Not that some have not tried to put other names there, but there are certain situations, certain tasks, certain jobs, certain roles that really only one name fits. And when it comes to salvation, when it comes to Scripture, we realize there is one very unique basket upon which we put a name that really only Christ's name fits. And, and we find actually all throughout Scripture, over and over again, these various descriptions all pointing to one specific person. Now, it's not to say that people have not tried to put other names in that basket and tried to take a moment of almost mistaken identity, put somebody else or something else in there. But Scripture always points us back and says, no, the only person whose name gets in this basket is Christ. Because he's the only one that checks all the boxes, the one whose, his, whose birth was foretold, the one whose mocking was foretold, the one whose even crucifixion was foretold. Foretold. And we're going to actually look at several Old Testament passages along the way today, looking and realizing Christ is the only one that checks those boxes. He's the only name that actually can fit in this basket and, and properly belongs there. So that we reach in, we should find Christ and Christ alone. And so this morning we're going to consider the cradle, the crown, and then the cross. Death happened without, so there might be life within. That's what we're going to find this morning. And as we do so, we're going to consider the cradle. If you're in Genesis chapter 3, we're going to specifically be looking at verse 15. What we find there is a promise of hope. Now, this is well within earshot of God's judgment against Adam and Eve and the fall of mankind. Because you're thinking, like, Genesis 3. Why would we go to Genesis 3? But there's a reason for that. As you're looking at that, you see the judgment of God against Adam and Eve and even the serpent that's going on there. And specifically, Genesis 3.15 is actually God's judgment against the serpent. And yet it's there that we find hope. And it's easy to miss because it is so subtle. But look at verse 15 with me. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. 
commonly referred to as the Proto-Evangelium, or the first gospel. This is the, the, this first moment in which there's a promise of future restoration, a promise of future hope that God is giving to Adam and Eve. And, and still in the midst of the judgment, he's, he's condemning them. All these things, they're all being condemned. And yet in that, there's a moment of promise of grace. That it will not always be like this. There is still hope. And ultimately what we find is like a baby's going to change everything. That's really what he's saying here. A baby's going to change everything. There's going to be this enduring conflict that's going to exist between the seed of the serpent and the seed or the descendants of the woman. There's this this going back and forth, but the baby is going to change everything. And Paul, I think, picks up on this. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, you can turn there if you want to. Uh, It's up to you. But 1 Timothy 2, 14 and 15 is actually one of them happened to be my, my favorite verse in high school for reasons that you will realize in a moment. Uh, and probably not really good ones, but uh, it was one of my favorite verses in high school. But it talks about this very idea that Paul is picking up on. So 1 Timothy 2, 14 and 15 says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing, if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. So in high school, it was all about the battle of the sexes, Right? And, and so that was one of the reasons why that was there. And the only re- reason I bring that up is not to take a dig on Mother's Day of all days at the ladies, but to help and make sure that we understand who Paul is looking at when he's thinking about it as he says this. He's thinking Eve here. And then when we look at verse 15, what do we see? Eve will be saved through childbearing. That's what, she, that's what he's saying. It's part of the promise that God was really making to Eve in the Garden of Eden. You will be saved through childbearing. Not that having a child will bring to you salvation. We don't want to get into the whole works idea. And yet it feels on the surface like that's what he's saying. What does he mean here? It means that the way of salvation will come through the birth of a child. A child that you will bear, that will come through. That's where hope is. And that's actually a promise that we find from Genesis 3 on really threatened. It's a much more tenuous situation or reality than you would ever care to realize. You would think, well, that that seems easy, that seems straightforward, but it really wasn't. It was constantly being threatened, constantly under attack for various reasons. And so what's interesting here is that Adam and Eve are just supposed to do what they were always supposed to do, even before the fall. Remember what God had done that, told them? Be fruitful, multiply over the earth. Be, you know, have dominion over the earth. Rule over it. This is your domain. Make it your own. Fill it up full of kids and fill it up full of, of, uh, uh, of livestock and, and trees and plants. and like Make it your own. Rule over it. That's what you're supposed to do. And even after the fall, that doesn't change. But he says, I, I promise you, I will redeem you through one of your children. That's where the hope lies. I think it's important that we understand that when he tells them to do that, nothing for them changed. There was nothing they could actually do to save themselves. They were helpless. They were dependent upon God for that. And we find that actually coming out here very, very quickly because in Genesis 4, 1, if you can look just down a couple verses, you'll see this. And I think Eve understood. I think Eve understood the significance of the child that God was talking about. Again, she says, or she says, Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. She's so excited. First time mothers, I think, are usually pretty excited over the birth of their child. She sees this and she says, Look, here's the promise fulfilled. God's blessed me. He's given me this child. The curse is over. It's done. The, the child that will bruise the head of the serpent is here. But we very quickly realize, even as we see the name Cain, this child will have more in common with the serpent than he ever did with the seed of the woman. Cain's a murderer and will not be the savior. He does not fit in that basket. He cannot check those boxes. But see, that kind of idea starts becoming a common theme in Scripture. This, this theme or this symbolism. And we look at the importance that children actually have all throughout Scripture, and we realize that the, how, how tenuous this really was and how, that how, many, how often children had a, a sense of hope for the family as they longed for them, or that it symbolized something, there was something significant about this child, and how often that was actually threatened. Case in, cases in point. Cain, of course, was a murderer, but shortly thereafter, it was uh, Abraham and Sarah, they're, they're longing for this child, and God gives them a promise, you will have a child. 
and they wait 25 years before that happens. They had already long been past the, the years of fertility, the years of being able to, to have a child. Naturally, it was too late. And then God makes them wait another 25 years so that it gets from unlikely and to, to really impossible. And then he blesses. But it was this long wait, and it seemed like the promise of God was threatened. But God made a way. And then it continues, because then later Isaac does the same thing, and I think waits almost 20 years for his twin sons, Jacob and Esau. And then that's, that's all they have. It's just the two. And then later, as, as uh, 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 Isaac did the same, or not Isaac, uh, Jacob with Rachel, and she is barren, and so all the children that he's having are coming through basically their, their handmaids or his other wife, and, and he's waiting for this. And then finally, Joseph is born, very, very late in the game. And then finally, Benjamin comes, and then, of course, she passes away. And then Joseph really kind of plays twice in this because Joseph, for all intents and purposes, is told that he, he's killed, killed by a wild animal. And, and Abraham, or, um, not Abraham, uh, uh, jo- Jacob thinks, like, I've lost him. We'll then find out later, no, 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 there's a whole conspiracy that's gone on here. He's actually alive and well over in Egypt, but he's re- re- restored to him. Then you go back forward more, and you realize Moses was born in very, very harsh times. He's saved in a little boat in the bulrushes, and then actually delivers the people of God. Obed was the answer to Naomi's lost sons. Samuel was born through the tears of barren Hannah. Solomon is the resultant child to David after his adultery, symbolizing the reconciliation that David has with God. The original promised child of Isaiah 7.14, who was certainly not Jesus, it was somebody else first that they were looking to, and it was a promise that God had not abandoned his people then, only later applied to Jesus. Then, of course, John the Baptist, and then, of course, Jesus himself, and the threats that were on his life many, many times. And there are so many more, but you realize so many of these promises were so... Fragile. They looked like they were never going to come to pass. They looked like they were going to be broken, and yet God made a way. He always makes a way. But all of these things were, in, some, in their own unique way, leading us to this place of looking squarely upon Jesus Christ and what God had planned for him from the very beginning. Though not immediately part of our text, The context does show how we got here and why really only Jesus can be this person. Only Jesus can check all these boxes. And this has always been God's plan. None of this was a surprise for God. He fulfills prophecy over and over again. So we move now from the cradle now to the crown, back into our context here. Let's look at verses 16 through 20. It says this, And the soldiers led him, Jesus, away inside the palace. That is, the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him. Hail, king of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of a purple cloth and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. We need to consider the crown. And this is really part of Jesus' enthronement. This is how he will ascend the throne. When we think of Jesus' crown, usually people reverse the order. It's the cradle, cross, and crown. Talking about Jesus' exaltation in glory when he goes to sit on the right hand of his Father. That's the crown that we're talking about. But before there was that crown, there was this one. The crown of thorns. But any time there's an enthronement, that's always a big deal. It's always full of ceremony and circumstance and, 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 and pomp. Like we were doing all this. Thing. It's, a, it's an exciting time. And this is truly no exception, although this is not an enthronement you would ever have wanted to attend. The soldiers here go out in their extravagance to enthrone this king, but not their king. And it's not a small group. If you look here at at verse, uh, the end of verse 16, it talks about a battalion. It's literally a cohort. It's nearly, probably around 600 Roman soldiers that were stationed here. The Bible says all of them. So we imagine that this large contingent, upwards of 600 people are doing that. And you know what happens when you get that many people all involved in something. Kind of that mob mentality can easily take over. They start egging each other on and encouraging each other. And it 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 starts to go down and down and down really quickly. 
And you can imagine how 600 guys are coming together with all their ideas of how to make fun of and mock and torture and humiliate the people that are in their care. And these soldiers are no exception to that. They're very creative when it comes to these things. So this mob mentality is here. And, and Herod, I believe, is the one that sends Jesus back here in this purple cloth. And if you look at Luke in the account there, it talks about Herod. Herod uh, Pilate had interacted with Jesus, sent Jesus off to Herod, and Herod sends him back. But he sends him back in splendid clothing, it says. So I think that's where this purple robe here in Mark comes to pass. And, here, and also why in Matthew it says that he was wearing a scarlet robe. So Jesus is wearing all of these clothes. Maybe they was on the discard pile that Herod had and, and just wasn't going to wear those anymore. I just felt like the opportunity is too good to pass this up. And so he, he dresses Jesus in these mock garments, the garments, the garments of a king. And the soldiers take light of this, and they do what kids do. They improvise. You know, kids playing dress-up, they, they become very imaginative, very creative in how they go about doing these things. And these soldiers are no exception, and they take, the, well, the king needs a crown. And rather than the, the golden laurels that the emperor would wear, they find some thorns, and they twist those all together, and they push them on Jesus' head. They say, well, the king needs a scepter which could here either be a papyrus reed, which would have been growing easily all along the Jordan River. It could even be something as simple as the shaft of an arrow, which among that many soldiers would have not been in short supply. And they hit him with it. It says, I can almost like see him putting it in his hand and Jesus holding it. It says, hey, why are you hitting yourself, Jesus? His kids are wanting to do. Why are you hitting yourself? But they mock him. And they cry out, well, the king needs a salute. So they say, rather than hail Caesar, they say, hail Jesus, king of the Jews. And rather than kissing him, they spit on him. And, rather than, and kneeling on him, rather for, for uh, they kneel in, in mockery, rather than allegiance. They go all out and they have their fun. To a very beaten and battered and tired Jesus. This is how they treat them. This is his coronation. This is how he will ascend the throne as he's getting ready to rise above the people. And I think before we move on from this, we have to understand that our involvement in this process as well. See, the mockery we find all over in this passage, it actually reveals our own heart attitudes towards Christ. That might seem like too much of a statement or too, uh, too much of a reach perhaps, but there are so many passages that actually talk about these very things that Jesus will be mocked mercilessly. And we have to realize that if we were in this moment, we would be doing it too. All of us. It's almost like it's part of the human experience or the human response to Jesus in general. But why, are people so, why are people so hostile to Jesus? You think about Jesus in the life that we have both here in Scripture and even in places outside of Scripture. It's very favorable towards Jesus. That Jesus was a very gracious and kind and honestly just downright benevolent person. Helping, healing, praying for people. And I think that's not what people had, took issue with. They don't look at his actions as like, oh, that's terrible. I can't believe he helped that guy. I don't think that's why people are having an issue here. What they're having an issue with here specifically is not what he uh, did, but what he said. He's going around and he's claiming to be able to forgive sins. He's going around and telling people, he's challenging their thinking, as he often did, especially with the, the Pharisees. He's confronting sin. He's doing all these, these things to them and challenging them on issues. And, and like, look, like, if you want to help me, Jesus, I'm more than happy for you to help me. But do not tell me how to live my life. Does that sound familiar? Is that not how we sometimes approach the Bible, approach God? You can help me, you can do things for me, but do not tell me how to run my life. It's just not how it works. And Jesus isn't going to let us be content with that. We're okay with that. But by mocking Jesus, it's a way to just simply dismiss all of his claims. You have no claim over me. And so they mock and they scorn trying to get rid of those things because nobody likes to be confronted by their shortcomings. No one wants to be told that they're wrong, and so they mock him. As Scripture said, they would. 
When we look at some of these, these passages, it's amazing what we find. Psalms 22, verses 6 through 7 says, But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me and they wag their heads. Psalm 89, 41. All who pass by plunder him. He has become the scorn of his neighbors. Or Isaiah 56. Isaiah 56. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. These are just a handful of the passages that tell us this is exactly how the Messiah, how Jesus was going to be treated. And we find them being fulfilled one after another after another, which is amazing that we can see these passages applied to the life that we see Jesus living all throughout the Gospels and the things that he did for people that nobody else could do, that nobody else could mirror and yet this is how he's treated. Everybody's doing it. And I think that's what this passage, even though we haven't read the, the, the final paragraph here, I think when we find that, we look at that, we realize everybody's doing this. Everybody's in on it. The, the priests are mocking. The soldiers obviously have mocked. But even the thieves on the cross are mocking Jesus, along with the crowds as Jesus marches his way along that, that way to the cross. Everybody is mocking Jesus. The world is mocking Jesus. And if we had been there, we would, have, we would have done so too. And so they put a crown on his, of thorns on his head. And we can put a check box, a check mark next to the box of fulfillment. There is no mistaken idea, identity here. Jesus is the one. So we started with a cradle. We've looked at the crown. Now it's time for the cross. Christ's throne. Let's read. Verses 21 through 32. And they, compl they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews... And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him, saying to one another, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. And those who were crucified with him also reviled him. We look at the cross and we consider the Via Dolorosa, this supposed route that Jesus used making his way out of Jerusalem into the wilderness, so to speak, to Golgotha. It means the way of pain, and it must have been that. The previous agonizing hours, you can imagine, taking their toll, really putting the, the limits of what humans can, can, can bear and do. And the soldiers are escorting Jesus through the, the streets. It was typical of the, the condemned to carry the crossbeam of the cross, because, of course, the soldiers aren't going to do that. And Jesus, so tired, so beaten, so weak, can't do that. And so the Roman soldiers do what Roman soldiers do. They conscript someone, probably from the area, to come in and do it for them. And that's where Simon of Cyrene comes in here. And I think he's listed here by name because I'm guessing in the moment the soldiers didn't introduce themselves. Hey, what's your name? Simon, can, can you come here and help? I doubt that. I would imagine they just reached over, grabbed him, and said, carry this thing. And he did. So how do we know his name? I think the fact that Alexander and Rufus are mentioned here, and Mark is, is acting like the people reading his gospel know that, that at least his kids were believers. I can't imagine that this incident didn't have a huge impact in his life, that maybe after the fact, he's like, who was that guy? What did he do? And he starts learning about Jesus and, and hearing about these things, and maybe himself coming to Christ. I mean, we, we don't know. We're reading certainly in between the lines here, but the fact that the, his kids are mentioned here means that those reading the Gospel of Mark probably knew who they were. I'm guessing this was a life-changing moment for Simon, as much as so many other people as well. But there's no way that if I'm Jesus, and I'm, I'm going here, I'm doing this, and he arrives here, that I'm turning down a drink. 
But that's exactly what they do, he does here. He's offered this, this wine mixed with myrrh, both of which would have had a deadening effect on, on the nerves and the, the pain, the excruciating pain that Jesus is already in and knows more is coming. But imagine, like, when's the last time Jesus had a drink? I doubt he had good care in any of the places that he was in. And having all this blood loss from the beatings and, and, and all the flesh being torn off of his body, I can imagine his body is going into, we need to make blood. He's got to be just absolutely just parched. And he turns it down. Why would he do that? Because he wants to be in his right mind as he suffers the cross. He wants to, make, like, he wants to have all of his mental uh, faculties with him as he's dying. And we realize again and again and again that Jesus was in his right mind as he willingly went to this cross, willingly embraced this. And there was nothing there that was dulling the pain or taking the edge off of that. He's not delusional. It's purposeful. And Mark's account here, as we continue on here, is so brief of the crucifixion itself. It's, it's amazing. It's just like he was crucified. And it's really it. But that plaque that Jesus was carrying through the streets, the king of the Jews, that, was, that kind of let the charges be known to everybody that was look, looking through, like, why is he condemned? It's right on the sign. And that's hung on the cross that he is the king of the Jews. And so now we see Jesus finally enthroned. And those places of honor that James and John had been so desperately wanting. Remember, Jesus, can we be on your right side and on your left? It's occupied by the thieves. What do we find? What do we find here? That the places of highest honor in the kingdom of God are run truly through suffering. Is that really what you want? Think carefully. But that's how you find honor and glory. It comes through suffering and sacrifice and pain and hardship. And again, we see this statement that Jesus, that, that, uh, about the temple coming back. You know, it's amazing to me how riled up that really got people. You know, you, you know destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up again and just like, that really bothered a lot of people, and it comes up here again. You said you could destroy the temple in three days and build it up again. So if you could do that, then certainly you're capable of getting off the cross. You understand their argument, I think, there. If you can do this great, magnificent event of destroying the temple, sure, certainly you can make your way off the cross. It feels like that should be a lot easier for you. Of course, they completely misunderstood what Jesus actually meant by that and not realizing if Jesus actually does get off the cross, which he certainly could have, he won't be able to save anybody. He has to stay there. To save anyone, he must stay there. We needed him to stay there. But looking at all these things, this is what I really want us to see here. If you were to go over to Jerusalem right now, there's actually two competing spots, so to speak, for where these events actually took place. You can look online, you can see them very easily, but uh, one is the Gar Gordon's Garden Tomb. It was kind of identified just, just right around the time of the Civil War, actually, about in the 1850s or so, 1860s, and, uh, and it was identified there, and, and it's a beautiful place. It's a beautiful tomb, it's a beautiful area, it's all been, been well cared for. There's actually an association that manages and takes care of it, and you can go there and take it all in, and it's, it's a beautiful place. It's probably not the correct spot, but it's a beautiful place to visit, well worth your time looking there. The other one is the, the, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. What's amazing here, you know, if you go over there, if you've taken tours, I know, I think, I think Pete and Alexis have been over in Israel, maybe some of you others have too. There's, there's no shortage of places and shrines and things, sites that you can go to and kind of check out. You know, there's, there's all kinds of, you know, they're like, hey, we think this happened here, and most of them are probably not true. This one actually might be. Like, the tradition that dates it to being the place where Christ was crucified it goes back like nearly 1900 years. It means that, that it's only about 100 years or so removed from the time of Christ when he was actually crucified. It's probably accurate. Can't guarantee that, of course, but it's probably accurate. It's truly amazing when you think about that. Like we, we can see that, but what that does for us, combined with Hebrews 13, 12, that Jesus was crucified outside near the gate, was it puts Jesus outside the city. And that's a theme we've seen in Mark over and over and over again. That Jesus, there's this great exchange that Jesus takes on, and he goes outside, and those who are outside, he allows to be able to go to the inside. 
We saw that in, I think it's Mark chapter 2, the, the, the leper. He's on the outside of the city. He can't go in. And Jesus is on the inside. He can come and go into the, the, the cities all he wants to. But after Jesus heals that leper, the leper is able to go home. The leper is able to go inside. But Jesus can no longer go inside those towns. He's, he can't. He'll just get swamped and overwhelmed. Now Jesus is on the outside. And we realize they've traded places. And that's actually a theme that we find going on all throughout the Gospel of Mark, especially. That Jesus trades places with us. He goes in and he takes the place of those who are on the outside and allows them to come in. And he is stuck on the outside. And here Jesus is outside Jerusalem, giving his life for those who are on the inside. And I think we're supposed to see that because, again, remember, what did, what did they just finish celebrating? The Passover. The Passover. And Jesus is the Passover lamb. And you remember how that worked. The lamb was killed and its blood was put on the wooden beams of the door on the outside of the home so that when the death angel would see the blood on the house, it would pass over, protecting those that were on the inside. And here's Jesus on the outside of the city on a bloody now cross so that when the wrath of God is there and it goes over, it will see the blood and it will pass over those who are on the inside. Do you see what Jesus did? He's traded places. He's, he's made a way for those who are on the outside to suddenly be on the inside. But you're thinking, and you're reading this, and you're like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You've just gone out of your way to show us that everybody's hating on Jesus. Everybody is mocking Jesus. Everybody is despising Jesus. There's, Jesus has no friends in these passages. Even the disciples are nowhere to be found. How is Jesus saving people who want him dead who are on the inside of the city? Well, it's true. Because everybody is dead set against Jesus here. The cry of the crowds and even Pilate and everybody else, they're against him. But it actually mirrors everybody's reality. Romans 5.8, among others, tells us that God shows his love for us. And what greater love could there be than a friend, one laying down his life for another? That while we were yet still, or still sinners, Christ died for us. It's a very simple and very familiar verse, and yet very important. That Christ died for everyone while we were still enemies. You have to understand, when, when Christ's blood is on that cross... He's making a way, providing a way that those who are on the inside can be spared. We have to realize that Christ's blood was put on that house, on an empty house. There's nobody in it. There's nobody in it. And Jesus rises again, and it's almost like then he runs to the doorway of that house and says, Come in. I have made a way for you. Come in. My blood is out on the outside so that when the wrath of God comes over this place, he will see that blood, and everybody who's on the inside of this house, they will be spared. He will pass over them. I've already borne that wrath, but you need to come in. And so there's an invitation to each and every one of us because we have to understand when we are born, we're on the outside. And we hear through the preaching of God's word and through the reading of God's word and the experience and, and the challenges that we have that are found here. And, and it's, it's Christ beckoning, come in. Come inside. We talk about being in Christ. That his blood is put on our account that we might be spared. And that's the offer to all of us. And each of us, and all of us need to make and come to that place where we can make that decision. Yes, I want to be on the inside. I want Jesus' blood to apply to my account. That's why he does this. But when he initially did it, there's nobody on the inside. We were enemies. We're all on the outside. Jesus makes a way for us to be on the inside. And so many of these crowds, I can only imagine as Jesus rises again and begins showing himself to so many people, they see this and they realize, wait, you're the one that we were yelling, crucify him. And the, the apostles are going out there and telling people about Jesus. And they start coming into the house. They start responding to the gospel message by the thousands. And here we are today. 2,000 years later, nearly, and here we are still proclaiming the gospel message. A message that millions if not billions, have responded to over the years, saying, I want to be in that house. I want Jesus' blood there. 
on my behalf. See, Eve was, was mistaken that Cain would be the Savior. And many people have made the same mistake. They've put other names in that, sometimes even looking in the mirror and saying, me, I'll be my own Savior. And we realize only Jesus can save. He's the only one. This is what he did. And it can be yours simply by calling on the name of Christ. Because that's what Jesus does. You know, it's hard to look at a passage like this that is so familiar to each and every one of us and try to look at it with fresh eyes. But it's important that we realize as we do so how much of this is truly a fulfillment of the Scriptures, that, that Jesus was born, his, his birth was prophesied, that his mocking was prophes- prophesied, even his death was prophesied. All of those things were prophesied. None of these things was an accident. This was always God's plan from the very beginning. And Jesus just keeps going through there, that's me, that's me, that's me. And we need to see it that way because we need to realize that nobody else can save me. Nobody else can do this for me. It's Christ and Christ alone or I am hopeless. This is the way that God chose to save the world at such great cost to himself. He took your curse so you could have his blessing. And I hope that's true for you. If it's not, let's talk after and like, what does that mean? And I'll tell you. Or ask somebody else. And if it is true of you that you are in Christ now, then enjoy it. It should put a smile on your face. That's what my God did. That's what he did for you. Thinking again about Genesis 3.15 as we close. When you consider what it is that was meant there, that it was crucifixion that Jesus was referring to when he says, he will bruise your heel. And we're talking about the mocking, and we're talking about the crucifixion, and all the horrors that Jesus had to go through and endure. If that understatement can can serve for the description of the crucifixion, imagine what is meant when it says that he will bruise your head. Let's pray. Dearly Father, we thank you for this day. We're very thankful to be able to share this message, one that is the old, old story. And yet, Lord, I hope we never get tired of hearing this old, old story. Because it is a story of reconciliation. It is a story of hope and of how we can have peace with you because of your great work on our behalf. Lord, thank you for what you have done for us through such great cost to yourself and through no work and through no effort that I could ever put into this. You offer it to me free. And so, God, I thank you and take it. Lord, I'm thankful for everyone in this room that has done the same, and I know there are many. But, Lord, if there are some that are maybe never hearing this message or never hearing it quite this way, Lord, I pray that you would grip their hearts and they might be receptive to what it is that you have accomplished and why you have done it that they might understand and know what it means to be on the inside. Because, you, Lord, you took their place on the outside. Thank you for loving us this way. May we now praise you, both now and forevermore. Amen.